This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 72, for broadcast on the 27th of September, 2019. Coming up on Space Time, hopes fading for the re-establishment of contact with the lost Indian Vikram lunar lander. Russia says it's not releasing any details about the cause of a hole drilled in the hull of a Soyuz capsule docked to the International Space Station last year. And there's been another near miss between spacecraft in orbit. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Hopes are fading for Indian space officials to re-establish contact with their lost Vikram lunar lander. The Indian Space Research Organization lost all contact with the lander during its final descent phase, three minutes before touchdown, and just 2.1 kilometers above the lunar surface. Vikram and its lunar rover each only had a mission battery life of 14 Earth days, meaning power has probably run out by now. The lander was spotted on the lunar surface by its Chandrayaan-2 mothership the day after contact was lost, seated in a single piece tilted on the surface, but with major damage after slamming down hard. The spacecraft was launched last July from the Shatish Dhawan Space Center on the Bay of Bengal coastline aboard India's most powerful rocket. Vikram and its lander were attached to the Chandrayaan-2 lunar orbiter. It was deployed at the start of September with the aim of establishing India as only the fourth nation after the Soviet Union, the United States and China to successfully land on the surface of the moon. Meanwhile, the Chandrayaan-2 orbiter is functioning nominally. It'll continue to circle the moon for the next seven years, collecting scientific data and providing high-resolution images of the lunar surface. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. Yeah, this... Um Moonshot by the uh, Indian Space Research Organisation uh, has ended in failure. Um, it looked so good for so long and then something dreadfully wrong happened. Uh, they're still trying to piece it together from what I can tell. <laughs> Maybe literally, that's Maybe right. Literally. So the good news part of this story is that the orbiter, Chandrayaan-2 itself, is in perfect working order. It's in orbit around the moon, and I think it's got a science to carry out before the mission ends. So we've got a really positive side to the story as well. However, the Vikram lander, which was dropped or propelled down to the moon, apparently functioned perfectly until it was within about two kilometres of the surface and then contact was lost. So that's, you know, not a good sign. No, definitely um, not. Even though for a moon landing, you've got to have the thing essentially under autonomous control because there's you can't beam the signal back to Earth and say, oh, tweak it here, because there's, there's that 2.6 second time delay between signals going from the moon to the Earth and then back again. And that's even if you, you, know, if you, if you instantaneously re respond. So it may well have survived, but the present news is that the lander has been located on the surface by the orbiter mm. uh, using uh, infrared cameras, actually, and they've found something that is thermally warmer than the, than the background lunar surface, and that's how it was identified. What is not known is whether a lander is in one piece or many pieces. I, I've uh, heard some conflicting stories about... Um what might have happened, they're talking potential engine failure. Uh, another yeah. theory is that the descent was good, but they miscalculated the moon's gravity, which means it hit the ground harder than it should have. Uh, the observe, uh, the observe observations from the um, uh, orbital craft seem to suggest it is upright, but on a slant. Okay. But bottom line is they, they still don't know exactly what went wrong. Yeah, that's that's the news I've Most got. Most likely engine failure, but they can't confirm that. And I suppose they're they're trying to communicate with it and hope that they can get some activity out of it. But at the moment, yeah, I mean that's right. It's yeah, you, you, you know, given that you've got an orbiter that um, that is under the same control, maybe it would be possible to to bring some information back. Mm. Um, so at the moment, that is you know, where, where the situation is. But, um, well, maybe fingers crossed for Vikram, the, the lander, which um, may, maybe it did land and maybe bits of it are intact. Yeah, um, it doesn't look good for the rover side of the 
the no, that's right. Situation. Which is it within? The, yes, which is within the uh, within the lander. Uh, either way, you know, it's still a, a monumental achievement for the Indian Space Agency, um, uh, and and all credit to them for for getting this far. And I'm sure that they will succeed in the long run. Mm, yeah, uh, it, yeah. Just you know, don't look at it as uh, absolute failure. Um, get up, dust yourself off, and go again. That's the, that's the best <laughs> that, way. And find a few. That could be a song, you know, Andrew. Find a few gazillion rupee while you're at it. <laughs> Which probably will help. Actually, the the Indian um, Indian Space Agency runs on a very very um, economic budget. It's very tight budget. In- interesting. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Well, the celebrations marking the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landings continue around the world. Some of the most important pieces of equipment sent up with Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins on their historic flight were the cameras used to document the entire event. And there were a lot of them. They included a 70mm Hasselblad electric camera, two 70mm lunar surface super wide angle cameras, a Hasselblad EL data camera, two 16mm Maurer data acquisition cameras, a 35mm surface close-up spectroscopic camera designed by Kodak Eastman, and numerous television cameras. As well as cameras in the crew cabins of both the command and lunar modules, a television camera was also placed inside the lunar module descent stage's modularized equipment storage assembly, basically a storage locker. It was this camera which made it possible to telecast the astronauts' first steps as they climbed down the lunar module's lander at the start of the mission's historic first-ever moonwalk. Afterwards, the camera would be detached from its mount and placed on a tripod and carried away from the lunar module to show the EVA's progress. But some of the most iconic and captivating still photography images taken during the mission were those taken with the 70mm Hasselblad 500 series semi-automatic EL data camera mounted on the front of the astronaut spacesuits. ESA TV's Leyland Sedalden reports. Not long ago, three astronauts named Neil, Buzz and Mike set off for the moon. Unlike the spacefarers before them, two of these men were going a giant step further. They landed on the moon. For about two and a half hours, Neil and Buzz explored the lunar surface, taking samples and pictures. What an achievement for rocket science, for space exploration, for the human race, and for photography. An astronaut not only walked on another world, he recorded the stroll. Later Apollo missions followed the example, capturing mind-blowing images in space and on the lunar surface. They used a camera in particular, made in Sweden, that came to be known as the Apollo camera. This is the story of how that Swedish camera made it to the moon. Hello from Gothenburg. My name is Leilan from the European Space Agency, and today we're in Sweden's second largest city to dig up some photos, moon photos to be exact. Gothenburg has a rich industrial and cultural history. Volvo was founded here in 1927. So many famous Swedish pop bands come from Gothenburg, including the only one I recognize from my childhood, Ace of Base. But Gothenburg is also home to Victor Hasselblad, who is an industrialist and most popularly known as the maker of the camera that was used on the moon. To find out more about how a Swedish camera ended up on the moon, we're going to be speaking to the nice folks at the Hasselblad Foundation. Elsa, a historian, and Gunnar, a camera technician who worked on the Apollo-era camera, walk me through Hasselblad history. Hasselblad made a name in the camera industry by selling and developing film. Their first go at actually developing a camera was during World War II. So here we have one of the first cameras that the Hasselblad company built, which was an aerial camera, and it was commissioned by the Swedish military. But Victor Hasselblad dreamed of making a civilian camera, and after a few failed prototypes, managed it in the late 1950s. But here you can see Victor Hasselblad in 1957. The camera was released in New York as well as the very first one, so you can see that's the 500C. While the landmark Hasselblad 500C cameras were highly sought after in the 1960s, the idea of sending one to space was more of an afterthought. 
Ova Bankston, product manager at Hasselblad, explains how one astronaut's hobby led to the company's professional relationship with NASA. In the first Gemini missions, they didn't bring a camera. On the second mission, they brought a tourist kind of camera. And they were very disappointed with the result. So they put together a team of engineers and astronauts. And one of the guys in that team was Walter Schirach. Luckily, he was an amateur photographer. He had his own Hasselblad. So he said to NASA, why don't we use this one? They were super happy with the results. The results are some of the most iconic images of all time. Earthrise, the eagle landing, man's footprint on the moon. But you can't simply send something to space without first qualifying it for spaceflight. Gunnar explains some of the technical adjustments made to the cameras to make them fit for space. So the normal civilian models for on the ground had a viewfinder, yes. but they took that away uh, for the models that flew into space. Why is that? For uh, it's a heavy, it's heavy maybe, and uh, you have a visir. You can't look at the end camera. It takes a lot of fuel to send something to space, so weight is very carefully considered. A heavy viewfinder is no use to an astronaut wearing a spacesuit and a chest-mounted camera. What else was modified? You might have noticed crosses on images on the moon. That's because of this, a Rousseau plate. This plate was inserted between the lens and the film, and whenever a picture was taken, the crosses from the plate would be exposed on the film and appear on the photo. They were used to help determine distance. All but one Hasselblad camera remained on the moon. A malfunctioning 500 EL used during Apollo 15 was sent back for troubleshooting. Gunnar worked on the moon dusty model, making sure to save as much of the dust as he could. He's one of the few humans to have a sample in his possession. <laughs> little container. <laughs> very, very little. Okay. That is moon dust. Hasselblad received copies of the negatives from NASA which they keep housed at the National Archive in Gothenburg. The first photographs from space weren't just scientifically and historically valuable. They were great PR for NASA and the space program, for environmentalism, but perhaps above all for human imagination and potential. Never before had humans been treated to an alien's view of their home or after Apollo 11 to another world altogether. And we want to see more. Not long from now, astronauts will return to the moon. And like the spacefarers before them, they will record the journey and take us along with them. From our view on Earth, it may seem like we're taking the same small steps. But looking out from the moon to Mars and beyond it's clear that this is where we take another giant leap. And that report by ESA TV's Leyland Sedalden. And you're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A Russian board of inquiry says it's found the cause of a leak which began venting atmosphere into space from the International Space Station a year ago. However, the Russian Federal Space Agency Roscosmos says it won't be releasing any details about the findings which are being given to the Russian President Vladimir Putin. The leak, which occurred on August the 30th last year, was quickly traced back to a hole in the hull of the Soyuz MS-09 capsule's orbital module, which had been docked to the space station at the time. The Soyuz spacecraft are made up of three modules. There's the orbital module, which houses the space station's docking clamps and equipment, as well as a toilet and storage lockers. Attached to the orbital module is the descent module, which houses the crew compartment, used for launch and re-entry, and equipped with controls, parachutes, and a heat shield. And finally, there's the service module, which houses all the Soyuz auxiliary equipment, solar arrays, and engines. The orbital and service modules are detached by explosive bolts prior to atmospheric re-entry. The hole which caused the atmosphere to vent into space was hidden behind padding in the orbital module's toilet area. Crew members used tape, patches and epoxy resin to quickly seal the hole, preventing any major loss of atmosphere from the space station. It was initially assumed that the hole was caused by space debris or micrometeoroid impact, long considered the primary threat to the safety of any spacecraft in orbit. While the space station is specially shielded to protect vital areas from micrometeoroid and space debris impact damage, shielding on the Soyuz spacecraft is far less extensive. 
However, the idea of space debris or micrometeoroid impact was quickly dropped when images of the hole clearly showed that it had been drilled, with drill bit damage also marking the surrounding area. It's generally thought the hole was accidentally drilled into the Soyuz MS-09 capsule during its manufacture, and then hastily patched up by workers both to cover up their mistakes and to ensure the spacecraft passed pressurization tests before flight. Then later, once in orbit, the patch gave out and air began leaking. Remember, Russia's space industry has been plagued with quality control issues for decades. However, some Russian media reports have been speculating that the hole may have been deliberate sabotage, drilled in orbit by a disgruntled or mentally unbalanced crew member. A claim not dismissed by Russian comments that the drill hole was caused by a deliberate or accidental action. A spacewalk by cosmonauts in December examined the area of the hole from the outside, cutting into the Soyuz thermal blankets and pulling away the insulation to expose the area around the hole and collect samples. Those samples were quickly returned to Roscosmos investigators on the ground. Whether the world will ever find out the truth about the cause of the drill hole is yet to be seen. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. There's been another near-miss in orbit in the past week as two disused spacecraft came close to colliding 550 kilometres above the ground. Projections had warned of a 1 in 20 chance that the defunct Soviet Union-era Cosmos 1300 spy satellite could collide with the Bigelow Aerospace Genesis 2 experimental space habitat. Luckily, the two spacecraft managed to pass each other without incident. This latest close encounter follows a similar incident earlier in the month when a SpaceX Starlink internet communications satellite came close to slamming into the European Space Agency's Aeolus scientific Earth observation satellite, forcing ESA to take evasive action. Incidents like this highlight the growing problem of overcrowding in orbit, where spacecraft and space junk travelling at 28,000 km per hour risk collision and damage. And worse still, the threat of triggering debris cascades, which could dramatically increase the dangers of spaceflight for hundreds of years. The 1,360kg, 4.4m long Genesis 2 module was launched in 2007 to test experimental inflatable space station habitat technology over a two and a half year lifespan. It's ultimately hoped that these inflatable modules will become the basis for future commercial space stations. A newer version of the Genesis 2 has been attached to the International Space Station for several years, and there are now plans to include larger versions on the new Lunar Gateway Space Station project, which will be constructed in translunar orbit over the next decade. The Soviet Union-era Cosmos 1300 spy satellite was launched in 1981 as part of the Selna-D military space-based radio surveillance program designed to listen in on NATO communication systems. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The United States Space Command has officially commenced operations. The command's an interim step in building a military branch-level space force, which must be approved by Congress. Space Command's initially inherited 87 units and 700 military personnel, covering missile warning, satellite operations, space control and space support from other sections of the U.S. intelligence and military communities. The new branch will also form a joint unified command structure with the National Reconnaissance Office, which operates America's spy satellites. The operation will see intelligence community assets coming under the operational and tactical control of the military if U.S. satellites come under attack during conflict. The major concerns at the moment include cyber, jamming and laser attacks, although anti-satellite missile attacks represent a growing threat as more and more nations gain access to anti-satellite missile systems. The South Australian state government has given its support to proposals to establish a new orbital rocket launch complex at the bottom of the Air Peninsula. The idea follows plans by Equatorial Launch Australia to develop rocket launch facilities near Nulamboy in the Northern Territory's top end. While the Northern Territory proposal would launch from close to the equator and therefore use Earth's rotation to lift additional payload mass into orbit for a given amount of fuel, the Air Peninsula proposal, being much further south, would use far more fuel for the same payload. NASA's already announced plans to launch at least four sounding rockets from the Northern Territory complex. Of course, rockets can now already be launched from the Woomera rocket range in the north of South Australia. Still, the South Australian government has declared the proposed Southern Space Launch Facility a major development project, claiming it's well-suited for launches into polar orbits. The complex will be built on a 1,190-hectare site at Whaler's Way, near the small fishing town of Port Lincoln, some 250 kilometres west of the state capital, Adelaide. 
Rockets launching satellite payloads of between 50 and 400 kilograms would blast off towards the south, flying over the Great Southern Ocean. If all goes to plan, work on the complex could be underway by next year. China has launched three satellites into orbit using its new Geelong or Smart Dragon 1 solid fueled rocket. The mission was flown from the Jiaquan Satellite Launch Center in Ganju Province in northwestern China. The 20 metre tall Smart Dragon 1 launch vehicle is part of a new series of specialty rockets designed to carry small payloads of up to 200 kilograms into 700 kilometre high sun synchronous orbits. The three satellites which make up the payload manifest for the mission will be used for remote sensing, communications and Internet of Things services. Shortly after the Smart Dragon 1 launch, China launched another solid fuel rocket from Zhaiquang, this one carrying two technological experiments. The microsats were flown aboard the Kaiju or Speedy vessel KZ-1A rocket. The launch was the third mission for the KZ-1A. The payloads included a microgravity experiment which could be used for future gravitational wave studies and an experiment testing new solar cell technology. The United States Navy has confirmed that it can't explain the footage from F-A-18 fighter jets showing unidentified aerial phenomena, Navy speak for UFOs. The objects were seen in three clips released between December 2017 and March 2018. The vision appears to show what are fast-moving oblong objects captured by advanced infrared sensors aboard the Navy jets. One piece of footage, apparently taken in 2004, appears to show sensors locking onto a target in flight before it accelerates out of view too quickly for sensors to follow. No, I took an auto track. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow, look at that. Look at the fly. <laughs> the two remaining clips, both taken in 2015, appear to show naval aviators chasing objects they think could be advanced drones, but which appear to be undertaking aerial maneuvers far beyond what they thought was possible. Yeah, that's a drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the SA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots from the west. Oh, I think, dude. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not. Uh, it is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's like another thing, it's rotating. And while we're on the subject of the truth being out there, UFO fans from around the world have beamed into the sleepy town of Rachel, Nevada, for what was planned to be a raid on the nearby Nevada Test and Training Range, better known around the world as Area 51. Using the slogan, they can't stop us all, more than two million people had pledged online to storm Area 51 and finally, once and for all, exposed the truth about America's captured alien UFO technology. But in the end, only 75 die-hard UFO enthusiasts showed up at the gates at the designated time of 3am, and they were quickly dispersed by the local Lincoln County Sheriff. Only one woman was detained after crossing into the restricted area, but two males were arrested, one on alcohol-related charges and the other, a Canadian, for indecent exposure. It seems most people just came for the party. Of course, Area 51, which is centred around the Groom Lake airfield, is where the top-secret U-2, A-12 Oxcart and SR-71 Blackbird spy planes were developed. It's also where the U.S. Air Force studies and flies captured Russian MiG fighters, and where F-117 stealth fighters, B-2 Spirit bombers, and F-22 Raptors were all tested and developed. And we can be pretty certain it's also where next-generation experimental stealth and black ops technology is being developed today. Back in the 1950s and 60s, Area 51 became infamous because of all the reports of strange-looking aircraft flying around there. Those unidentified flying objects quickly morphed into claims of testing captured flying saucers and holding the remains of aliens said to have been retrieved from the famous Roswell UFO crash in 1947. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A follow-up study has found no increase in rates of brain cancer among Australians aged over 60, which could be linked to cell phone use. 
The findings reported in the British Medical Journal follows up on a 2018 study which looked at brain cancer rates in Aussies aged 20 to 59 between 1982 and 2013. But critics of that study suggested they should have also included the over 60s as they would have had the highest incidence of brain tumours. So the authors of the original study looked at this age group, finding that the rates of brain cancer in people aged 60 plus follows a very similar pattern to other age groups, with no increase since the widespread introduction of mobile phone technology. Scientists have shed light on the link between heavy cannabis use and poor sperm quality, showing that parts of a signaling system which is activated by cannabis is present in human testes. Previous research had shown that the signaling system, known as the endocannabinoid system, was linked with sperm quality and function, but little was known about whether components of the system could actually be found in the testicles. Scientists not only found the components in human testicles, but also showed that they could be involved in sperm development. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, adds to science's knowledge of possible associations between marijuana use and changes in semen quality and reproductive hormone levels in young men. New researchers found that habitat loss is a major concern for hundreds of endangered Australian bird species, with southeastern Australia being the worst affected. A threatened species recovery hub study has found that half of all native bird species have lost almost two-thirds of their natural habitat across Victoria, as well as parts of South Australia and New South Wales. You can read the findings in detail in the journal Conservation Biology. The Reuters news agency is reporting that Australia's Cyber Intelligence Agency has confirmed that China's Ministry of State Security was behind a cyber attack on Australia's national parliament and its three largest political parties in the lead-up to last May's general election. It's claimed that sources within Australia's Signal Directorate also confirmed Beijing was behind cyber attacks targeting the Australian National University and the Bureau of Meteorology. Reuters claim this story is supported by no less than five independent sources. The attacks on the political parties would have given China access to party policy papers on taxation and foreign policy. It would also have exposed private emails between lawmakers, their staff and constituents. Meanwhile, the attack on the Australian National University gave Beijing direct access to student data, allowing China to identify local students supporting the Hong Kong student protest movement and therefore target their families still living in China. The reports also claim Australian investigators shared details of their investigations into the Chinese hack with their American and British counterparts. Last year, the Australian Signals Directorate advised the federal government to ban China's telecoms firm Huawei from the new 5G network due to major concerns over cyber security. Ohio has become the latest of several state and local government agencies in the United States to stop law enforcement officers using facial recognition databases. The move follows reports that ICE, the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, has been scanning millions of photos from drivers' license databases. Researchers at Georgetown University discovered the secret operation, which was being undertaken without the consent of individuals or any authorization from state or federal lawmakers. They found U.S. Customs and Border Protection is undertaking similar activities, and the technology giant Amazon was developing facial recognition partnerships with local police. The thing is, a report in the journal Nature says there's little evidence and no peer-reviewed scientific data that biometric technology can identify suspects quickly or in real time. In fact, Axion, the world's largest supplier of police body cameras, says it won't be deploying facial recognition technology in any of its products because it was too unreliable for police work. Scientists with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Microsoft found that even the most advanced facial recognition software failed to accurately identify dark-skinned females 35% of the time, compared to a just 1% error rate for white males. Meanwhile, researchers from the University of Essex found facial recognition technology used by London's Metropolitan Police made just 8 correct matches out of a series of 42. Gigantopithecus was an ancient primate, standing up to 3 metres tall and weighing up to 600 kilograms. This Wookiee-like creature was native to Asia from around 9 million years ago through to about 100,000 years ago, meaning it would have been around at the same time and in the same place as the early hominid Homo erectus. Gigantopithecus is as close as science gets to the real origin of the legendary folklore creature of the Himalayan mountains called the Yeti. And of course the Yeti isn't alone. North America has the Sasquatch or Bigfoot, which has been part of Native American legend for hundreds of years. And, of course, Australian Aboriginal legend has given us the Yowie. 
The trouble is, with the exception of the extinct Gigantopithecus, there is absolutely no scientific evidence supporting the existence of any of these creatures. That's despite no shortage of blurry photos and jerky videos. There's not a single bone, a clump of hair, or even roadkill. Now a paranormal investigator trying to gain his claim to fame says there are Bigfoots in New Zealand and he's not talking about bouncers at the local dance club. A man who's been unsuccessfully searching for Sasquatch in the United States claims there's an ape-like creature in Maori legend which he intends to find. But as Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics points out, locals aren't taking him too seriously. Every country almost has its Bigfoot or Sasquatch or Yowie. We did a study a while ago looking at theories across the world as to which country has one of these things. Singapore has one. In a small park in the middle of Singapore, there is supposed to, supposed to be one of these things. So New Zealand's got one too, apparently, and it's called the, uh, the word that I cannot pronounce properly, and any sort of Kiwi people will probably pick me up as the Maohai, and I think that's it. But anyway, it's supposed Possibly a long-standing Murray sort of um, theory. Other people who have come from that sort of background say, no, that was only fairly new, actually. So there's a lot of different views as to how long-lived this heritage of this particular creature is. The problem with all of these things is that you need a large number of breeding population to sustain a population at all. You can't have one of them because they won't last that long. Um, you can't even have two because they won't necessarily last that long and they tend to inbreed with the kids, etc., which doesn't help. You have to have a whole tribe of them and if you have a whole tribe of them you should have noticed it by now especially in some of these smaller areas I mean middle of Singapore forget it this guy is a Bigfoot fanatic he's been working in America for a fair while searching up Bigfoot and now he's trying to do this he's a Kiwi I think but he's now trying to do it in New Zealand up in the Coromandel area the north of the North Island of New Zealand he's got a crowdfunding site where he's hoping to sort of raise some money for a movie he wants to make a documentary it looks unlikely he's going to get it last time I looked he's asking for 5800 and he's got six $65. So I don't think he's going to make his goal of reaching enough money to make a documentary, at least not crowdfunded anyway. Honestly, he's got a little video on his crowdfunding site and it's just someone wandering through the New Zealand bush and not finding anything. So he's trying to do a Kiwi version of finding Bigfoot from the Animal Channel. Yes, yeah, I think so. And there's a lot of people who are doing this and they get the little cameras or they get their GoPro taped to their helmet or something and wander through the bush and try and find something. And really, the evidence is not very good. And what what I always say to people who say, but there's so much evidence that it's all, none of it's good. And you know, a lot of two out of 10 rated evidence, if you have a hundred of it, doesn't make a 10 out of 10. It makes a lot of two out of 10s. And really, if you have all that sort of bad evidence, you start wondering if there's any basis to it at all. And certainly at the moment, there ain't none. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 